محمد رسول الله والذين معه أشداء على الكفار رحماء بينهم تراهم ركعا سجدا يبتغون فضلا من الله ورضوانا سيماهم في وجوههم من أثر السجود ذلك مثلهم في التوراة ومثلهم في الإنجيل كزرع أخرج شطأه فآزره فاستغلظ فاستوى على سوقه يعجب الزراع ليغيظ بهم الكفار وعد الله الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات منهم مغفرة وأجرا عظيما أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم The Imam of our time My mothers, sisters, brothers, friends Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Welcome to our special edition today of a soulful Thursday on Lantern of Light So what is Lantern of Light before we get started? This actually began three years ago as a journey for sisters for people to be able to get together and have somewhere where they are able to grow on their path of getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the busyness of life, sometimes it's difficult to find somewhere to go or someone to talk to. But this initiative was made up in order to provide somewhere where they have a place that individuals can talk and come together with like-minded people to understand the struggles that people could be going through. Again, through the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Holy Quran tells us, Allahu nurus samawati wal ard. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the light for the heavens and the earth. And it is this light that hopefully Lantern of Light has tried to be able to build something with, to be able to help those who may be struggling in their own paths, individuals who are stumbling on their journey, and not just someone who falls, but someone who falls and then picks themselves up to become better individuals, to be able to fulfill their purpose on their way, on their divine journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is also the website of Lantern of Light, which inshallah I will share towards the end of the program. So please do join. And also on Instagram of Lantern of Light official page, where you will see quotes, you will see programs coming up, small reels that inshallah will be able to inspire you on your journey of getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So today on our Soulful Thursday, I'd like to invite a very, very special guest. Now, I'm sure most of you, even if you haven't read it, I'm sure most of you have heard about this book, The Secrets of Divine Love. And yes, I'm proving that I have the book with me. It's an absolute gem of a book. And before we get to dwell into it, today we have the honor of having the actual author with us, Sister A. Halwa. Now, normally when we have a book club or we talk about a book, it's always what I think of the book or what somebody else interprets from the book. But today, alhamdulillah, we have the honor of having the actual author. So to be able to get in the mind of the author, to understand why she has written what she has written and how these words have so beautifully flowed out in order to connect a heart and a soul to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So just a quick introduction of the sister. Sister A. Halwa believes that every single person on this earth is deeply loved by the divine, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She's an award-winning writer who has inspired hundreds and thousands of readers through her passionate, poetic way of writing and her love-based writing based Islamically and spiritually. With over 15 years of experience in what she does, she writes and speaks in Islam and spiritual development and draws lessons and experiences from her personal life to be able to explain and add to the understanding the secrets of divine love 
to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Her poetic way of writing, her inspirational way of writing, I'm sure if you've read the book, you'll know it has been mind-boggling, it's been heart-grabbing, it's been soul-touching, because it allows you to connect to a very inner part of your soul. She does many vlogs, and she is able to be found online at a.halwa underscore, or on her website at www.authorhalwa.com. These are places where, inshallah, you're able to read more of her work and, inshallah, listen to more of her work as well. So without further ado, let me please welcome our esteemed guest today, Sister A. Halwa. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam. Thank you so much for having me on the show. I'm already amazed and impressed by the way that you have um, set this up and the excellence and ihsan in which you present. It's really remarkable, and I just wanted to say... I'm amazed. So thank you. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Thank you. It was just an introduction to be able to make the readers understand who we actually have with us today. And even before I talk about everyone else, I have to tell you from a personal experience, I have never been more drawn to a book like I have been to this book. Um, I'm not much of a reader, for those who might know me, but this book, I just can't seem to put it down. And the most amazing thing is, and it's not just me who has said this, every time I read the same passage, I go back to read it again. And a new purpose comes out of it, a new meaning comes out of the same thing that I just read. And that's absolutely beautiful. And it makes me realize that when you connect spirituality to that love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there can be miracles in your writing. And I'm sure you're amazed yourself of how these words have transpired and inspired so many people around the world. Alhamdulillah. Um, I think that for me, I'm, I'm, I'm so aware of my fault. And because I know me, I know how faulty I am. And so for me, it's 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 a it's a miracle because I know I know just how much help I needed. Um, and Allah was there every step of the way to fill in the gaps. And and the words themselves are inspired by none other than His words so and the example of the Prophet, peace be upon him. So it always feels weird. It feels weird just to even have a pseudonym on the book because it's hard to take ownership over something like that because no one reaches for a book like this because of me. It's everyone seeking God. That's what we're that's, looking for. That's amazing. And you managed to find that place to be able to put these words into a book. And that's exactly where my first question was coming from. So many people are wondering, you know, when you have a self-help book or a self-development book or someone you see that has done really well in the world, there has to have been a story or there has to have been of some background or some struggle that have led them to do this amazing thing that they have. And I love the humility with which you speak, that it's not your words, it's the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, you know, you have put into this book. But have you had a journey or has something happened in your life that made you come to the conclusion of, I want to write a book? Yeah, that's um, it's a great question. I kind of allude to it in the book uh, with a story about, you know, just like it, it, you know, a lot of people ask, what do you mean? You know, basically the story is a, um, like almost like feeling a prayer in the world. And it sounds very strange because, well, it is strange and it doesn't really make sense to me either, but it just felt like, almost just like felt a prayer. Um, it's kind of like when you you think of someone suddenly and you message them and they're like, wow, I really needed to, to, to for someone to reach out to me today. Like, how did you know? And you're like, I didn't know. It was just like an intuition. Kind of like that, it, it felt like I felt a prayer and whatever that prayer was, it created a fuel inside of me. And with the help of Allah, like helped me to go past some of the voices of, you know, I'm not the most educated and the most scholarly and I haven't, ha you know, went to school for 40 years and I didn't do, I didn't have the, all that. And yet here I am feeling like this prayer and I'm, it's like, I feel called to send that text message to the friend, but that text message happens to be a book, <laughs> 300 something pages. Um, and so I think for me, it kind of, that began the journey of putting the the words on the page. I had been studying Islam for several years before that, but had never felt the draw to put it into a book until I felt that prayer. And so in a lot of ways, starting out the book, for those who've read it, it's like, I really feel this 
gratitude to that person wherever in the world they are. Um, and since then, I've probably gotten dozens of messages being like, I think I'm that person with the prayer, you know, which is very sweet because it really means it can be anyone. Um, and there's a beauty in that. And I, and I also think of the places my prayers have landed and the teachers that have come into my life or the blessings that Allah has sent me through other people's um, commitment. And so it, um, it, it just feels like it creates the sense of an ummah, which I'm grateful for. That's beautiful. So you're saying this book actually came about as if it was a dua from your heart. Was there anything that was happening in your life, if you were able to share it with us, or any struggles that you were facing in maybe connecting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? As I see, this is the main theme that runs through this, to explain to us that Allah is love and Allah is mercy. And as we grow up, and I'm talking about, you know, ourselves in our communities, sometimes you're taught that if you don't do this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will punish you. But this book makes you realize and actually makes you fall in love with the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So had something happened in the past that made you, you know, question that, made you feel that, that, you know, made you ask that dua and in turn, you know, got the book where it is today? That's a great question. You know, um, when I was, basically by the time I was in high school, I stopped praying. I was born Muslim. And for 10 years, I didn't pray. So it wasn't until my mid-20s that I refound my connection, early 20s, refound my connection with Allah. And so I very much felt what it feels like to be distant from God. And despite always believing in Him, that distance, there's something that's heartbreaking about it. Kind of like a flower that's meant to be in the sun that you bring inside. And it longs for the light, but it can't get to it because it's planted in a pot. And in that same feeling of that, that flower that needs the, the person to sort of pick it up and put it outside, it's like I need, like I, I, I was stuck in a plant, like in a pot. And somehow, by the grace of God, not by my own achievement, by my own action, I don't even, I don't see it by something I did. It was just the blessing of Allah that he brought me back outside in the light. And I have, I can't take any credit for that because he sparked this light inside of me that had been dim for so long. And so in that moment, there was a feeling of feeling loved despite having done nothing. <laughs> like there was, you couldn't say, you know, oh, I prayed for 20 years or I was committed in all these ways because I wasn't. And that actually sparked a lot of the, with this book, one of the, um, one of the most, for me, heart opening experiences is sharing this book in prisons. Because in a lot of ways, I was in a prison, a prison of my own making, but nonetheless in the house, dark, dim, wanting to be in the light. And so I have this affinity and this connection with the story of, you know, inmates. And I, and I think just going back to like, when I first visited the prison, I remember a, um, one of the um, Muslims, you know, he, he looked at us and he said, you guys are in a prison in the world. I'm free in here because I have nothing but Allah. And nothing prevents my remembrance of God. Not food, not television, not people, nothing. And I'm going to be in here. To, he was a lifer, which means he'll be in prison until he dies. And I'm not, in, I'm free. And I just remember thinking like the beauty of that statement. And so in my experience too is like, well, I wasn't in prison, but I was imprisoned. And so I feel like the gift that Allah gave me that I could have never earned. I just wanted to remind people that they're loved in case they forget like I did. That's absolutely beautiful what you've just said. And I think um, it's going to have hit so many hearts because I know it hit mine just now. And it's so true that sometimes we wait for the right moment. You could have waited to be in a good place, um, in the right Zen, in the right frame of mind before you decided to write a book or a self-help book. But at the time that you were at your lowest, it's suddenly where you 
decided or you felt this need. And it's amazing how the answer of your dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came through you writing and through you being there to help others. And it's amazing what you just said about um, going to this prison and uh, what the man had said to you about, you know, we have so many distractions in this world and we think all of these things sometimes help us get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it's very powerful that he said, I have nothing to distract me. And through that, I picked a, a part of your book that when I was reading really struck me. And, you know, it's it's a dua that's really stayed with me that, again, I'm going to, obviously, you've written it. But to share with our viewers um, a part that really hit me. And it, I think it links to this really well. And it says, oh, Allah, protect me from any success that will turn my heart away from you. My Lord, protect me from any failure that will turn my heart away from you. Remind me that if I am given this world, but I lose you, that I have nothing, I have gained nothing. I have lost what is perishing in exchange for you, who are forever and eternal. Remind me that my preference do not determine what is good or bad for my soul. Remind me that when my heart turns to you, whether it is through a trial or a blessing, it is always good. And remind me that when my heart turns away from you, whether it is due to a trial or a blessing, that is always bad. My Lord, remind me that what is with you is always good, and what makes me forgetful of you is always bad. Allow me to stay on your path. I thought this was so powerful, because sometimes I feel we're only yeah. looking for the good this times, and those good things were like, you know what, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you love me, because you've given me this goodness, not realizing that sometimes it is through the trials and the pain that get us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So where did this part come from when you were writing it? Was there any particular um, aspect that made you come out with this dark? That's a great question. Um, you know, a lot of the du'as in the book, it was just a moment in time, allowing the words just to come out of my heart. And I've said this, um, it's um, for me, I would I would rather just make prayers <laughs> like on the spot than share anything because it just feels like the heart speaks whatever it's seeking. And I think that the prayer is like a desperation. And I used to in the beginning on the path, not want to feel needy. You know, the feeling of being needy doesn't feel good. The feeling of being desperate doesn't feel good. But I recognize that it's actually the least crowded pathway <laughs> because nobody wants to seek God from poverty. Nobody wants to seek God from neediness. But actually, the only way to acknowledge infinity is through nothingness. You can't know that that can't be measured only through being nothing. How do you receive everything except that you're nothing? And like, to me, that's what la ilaha illallah means. And it's that negation that allows for the receptivity. And so now in states of neediness, I recognize that my neediness actually allows me to recognize how desperately I, I need Allah. And it makes space for me to receive his qualities and his names. And so I rem like, for example, I remember being at dinner and we were waiting for a waiter to bring us food. And it was like 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. And you know, when plates go by and you, you're like, oh, is that my food? And it just passes you and you feel this moment of, oh no, like, and you're really hungry. And I remember a friend said, um, man, they haven't served us anything. And then somebody else said, yes, they have. They've served us the dish of patience. SubhanAllah. And you can choose to eat from it or not. And in that moment, like, then every moment is an opportunity to know God. The prayers may change on your tongue, depending on what your heart is seeking. But in every moment, you don't have to wait for there to be deep desperation. If you just take a second, you'll recognize, I mean, I'll, I always recognize that I feel very poor before al Ghani. That's, uh, that's beautiful. And I, I love how you've picked up on these names um, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and um, constantly in the book. Um, I haven't completely finished it, but seeing the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala coming up again, you've used um, the power of the divinity and the names of divinity within these books to allow us to connect to him because it's very difficult to fall in love with someone that you don't know. 
And the mm. fact that we can't see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the only thing we're given is these 99 names, but I feel these are more than enough to understand the graciousness, the patience, the love, uh, the forgiving nature of our Rabb. And I think it's so important to learn these names, to understand them, and then to hopefully become this person. Now, when someone looks at us, they might not know God, but they learn to know God through us. And I think because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I've blown my ruh into you, we have the ability to manifest these qualities, but it's just about how am I going to do it once I recognize his. And I think that's so powerful that you've used these um, names in the book. And especially the way you said every, there's a part in the book where you've written um, every calamity or every phase is a face of God. So in every situation, we need to learn to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So a question I'm going to ask you, how easy was this for you to now put into your life? You've written it in the book and, you know, people are hopefully trying to grab this and learn from it. How is it easy has it been in your life to be able to put Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, you know, everything that you do? Well, it's it's the intention, I, I hope. And, and when there is awareness, then it's easy because Allah's presence is everywhere. He says, I am with you wherever you are. And at the same time, the human being is forgetful. So um, I think in a way, I'm always faulty. And I used to see the faultiness would turn me to shame, which would make me feel like I'm not good enough. But now my faultiness just makes me realize how desperately, like I mentioned, I need a law and how perfect it is because my lack is the only thing he doesn't have. Sounds strange to say, right? Because upon Allah, like how can you compare anything to Allah? We, we, we can't. And yet the God doesn't have lack. God doesn't have need. So the only thing I come to him with is the thing that he doesn't have, which is he's not needy. I'm needy. And so it creates this ability to receive. And so in terms of seeing or being present with Allah's presence, for me, it actually starts with triggers. You know, a lot of times when we get triggered, and when I mean triggered is when someone says something and it upsets you or something happens and you feel angry or you have an emotional response, we tend to feel like we can go to blame or shame. But for me, that's like become an incredible opportunity to go to a law. Because when something agitates me, I recognize it's a way that a law is like trying to wake me up to something. So like if someone says something, a stranger, and it agitates my spirit, perhaps it's a way that Allah is telling me that I'm imprisoned by opinion of someone else. And he wants to free me from that. So my emotions trigger anger, difficulty, constriction, but that can turn me to God. And so if I see all my temptations as an opportunity to pray to Allah and ask for help, if I can see my triggers in the moments I get angry or upset or I'm struggling, all the different vices we may go through, people go through greed or lust or whatever it may be, instead of going to shame, if I can turn that to God, then in every moment, even in my moments of temptation, I can witness him. And I think for me, that's been the most as a very faulty, everyday, average Muslim on the path. It's been such a gift. Because I, I, I have somewhere to go with my humanity. And in recognizing that when I acknowledge my humanity is when I can actually acknowledge his divinity. When I acknowledge my imperfection, I can actually acknowledge something of his perfection. When I acknowledge my brokenness, my scatteredness, my um, dispersedness, I can actually acknowledge his unity, his oneness, his wholeness. And so once I recognize that in my brokenness I can experience God, then it was this incredible freedom to have a relationship with him, not with fake perfection, not with pretending, not with rejecting my feelings, but actually bringing all that I am to the table, knowing that God already knows it anyways, and having this really special relationship with Allah that's not based in, in shame. 
That's that's so beautiful because when we when we go to people, we're always trying to be, you know, the best version of ourselves. We don't want anyone to see our vulnerability. We don't want anyone to see the neediness we might have, the shame or the imperfection. Because of us as humans, it's it's a human trait. But this is a place you're right that you go to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and by understanding and acknowledging your own imperfections is the only way you can understand His perfection. For you to understand light, you have to understand the darkness. You know, mm. and I think understanding this makes it so beautiful to know it's in my brokenness that I will find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's in those cracks that that Spot. light will uh, then come in. So thank you. That's so beautiful. So um, just for the viewers who are watching, this is a live show. So if you have any questions, any comments, please do feel free to write them on the YouTube chat. And inshallah, we can read them out uh, to Sister Halwa, who will then be able to answer or give us some comments back if they are for her. So I do have a few bits that I'm going to read out for you, Sister. Um, we have someone saying, Alhamdulillah, this book makes your soul touch the divine love with all of your senses. It makes me feel even closer to God. Alhamdulillah, thank you so much. It helped me to feel so much inner peace. I'm not normally a good reader, but this book is the best book that I have ever read. So Alhamdulillah, you're doing something right. Mm -hmm. um, we have another sister saying, uh, there is something about your voice and your energy, Sister Halwa, something so deep. Thank you for showing us a sniper of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love. Um, Alhamdulillah. We have another comment saying, um, Sister Halwa, can we know something about you? So where are you from and how did you get such a powerful gift of writing a book? Are you normally a writer? Were you a writer from before? Uh, we just want to get to know the actual person behind this name. So, mm. yeah. Thank you so much for your comments. Um, I'm humbled and I'm grateful. Alhamdulillah. I am... Um, I'm from California. I was born and raised here. So I grew up in, in the West Coast. Um, in terms of writing, to be honest, like I've always written poetry. That's been the form that I've loved. <laughs> it's very short form. <laughs> so to write a book was completely outside of um, what I was used to. Uh, actually, if you ask me, <laughs> my favorite subjects have always been math. Oh, no way. Um, and my least favorite subject has always been writing. <laughs> Wow. So um, I think that I, in a way, knowing myself, this all just seems so much more surreal because I would have preferred numbers to letters. Um, but Allah has his, um, has his path for us. And so I also say that to say that if there's something on your heart that you're meant to do, don't look at what capabilities you have in your toolbox. Because a God dream, in my opinion, is a dream that you could not achieve without divine intervention. So if your dreams are achievable without that, you're not dreaming big enough. And so sometimes I think, especially because I like I am completely in love with the prison system, like not the prison system, but serving the prison system by bringing books to Muslims in prison and and helping with re removing sentencing time and stuff like that. And I have these unbelievable <laughs> dreams about it that just don't make sense at all. And I love it because I know that I need divine intervention. And so if there's something on your heart you want to say or do for this path, for, for Allah, for the sake of Allah, you just take the first step. And Allah says in the Quran, like, we're not the owner of the outcome. He is. You're just going to be asked if you if you strived, if you took the first step, if you did the best you could. The outcomes don't belong to me or you or any of us. And there's such a there's something so beautiful about that. Can you imagine any other relationship where, you know, at work, you're like, well, the outcome doesn't belong to me. That's not going to cut it with your boss, you know? Yeah, but with a lot, it's just your intention. It's the did you plant the seed? And so, um, yeah, I hope Tell that me. at least I a testament yeah. to, to that. I know my friends who know me know, but um, <laughs> yeah, so inshallah. But that's that's amazing. I think that's all we can do is you know, constantly refine, constantly check our intention, making sure uh, we are doing the best thing that we can. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is this for him? Is it to get us closer to him? Is it to help us on this divine path? And 
as long as we're doing that, you know, you're right, the outcome is left to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whatever happens thereafter, you know, I did my best, I leave you the rest, and I think that's uh, really powerful, so thank you for sharing that. So just a few other bits that have come up, um, Sister, may Allah bless you, it refreshes one's iman by reading this valuable book. Um, we would love to know more about your work. Um, thank you, Lantern of Light, for giving us the opportunity to listen to the best reader. And yes, you are the best-selling reader, international reader, and international author at the moment. So alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, that's beauty of yeah. itself. And as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that you quoted, you take the first step and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala literally comes uh, running to you. And it's, it's amazing. We can see through this book how you've um, encapsulated and inspired and motivated so many hearts, um, hopefully to get back onto that path of love. Of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, another question about yourself. What are your actual qualifications? Did you study English literature? Because the way each and every word and letter portrays in your book is immensely beautiful. And I have to, I have to second that. Every single thing that's written in this book, I feel like reading the line again and again and again. So I started making notes of this book when I started reading it. I thought, oh, this line's really good, and I noted it down. And then I read the next line, and I was like, oh, that line's really good. And I thought, I've just literally been writing your book out again because I don't know what to choose because it's just beautiful, absolutely beautiful. So is this something you've done? Um, I know you said poetry, but is it something you've actually studied? So that's a good question. Um, actually, I'll say that I didn't read at all very little and then i came back around to my faith and i must have read through hundreds of islamic books in a short period of time and so actually reading the quran in very short periods of time like 10 days reading the whole book reading it to the point where you start to see connections between parts that you normally wouldn't if you read it over a year or over a month or a few months and so it's just like following the inspiration. It's funny when people ask for qualifications when it comes to writing. I can't show you a certificate of, you know, of a course I took writing courses, but that I could say, you know, I studied language. I didn't. I studied Islam, specifically peacemaking and mediation through the prophetic path was something that I was interested in. Um, and I spent several years learning about that and then eventually teaching it but really i was interested in the mediation between the nafs and the soul so that's like a whole nother world that i haven't shared about but it's something that inspired the book in the way that it moves um because it's really a reconciliation between the ego and the spirit um when you know to look for that you you'll see that thread um and, and I, I want to share something, actually, I don't really normally share, but I felt called to because of the conversation we had before coming on here. Um, because I feel like as someone who stopped praying, um, you know, when I was coming right into high school in a very formative years, um, when I came back to faith, one of the first poems I wrote is something I want to share with you guys if it's okay. Um, it's not something that's published or shared, but it's, it's I, I hope that it gives you hope um, and allows you hopefully to feel seen in your experience if, if you've ever had doubt or struggled with the way that your faith has been shared um, at different stages of your um, being on the path. So it's gonna be like a few minutes if that's okay. Please, please, Bismillah, I'd love to hear it. Bismillah ar-Rahim. The day I learn God's name, I also learn guilt. I also learn shame. Self-hate was the first messenger that came. See, as a child, no one told me that God and punishment were not the same. The way I was raised placed even more seeds of fear into my faith. Preachers paved into my brain. So many pathways of brimstone and hate that the thousand sermons in my head eventually braided into a single voice that said, you will never be forgiven. You will never be saved. Before I could even love God, I was already far too afraid he would throw me into an ocean of flames. Shame is a disease that seeps 
into my heart vein deep. But it's more than this blood that I bleed. It bleeds into my self-worth convincing me I'm nothing more than my weight and dirt shame is a cigarette bud in a forest of dry brush. It doesn't take much for it to burn you up and make you think you don't deserve to be loved. I didn't think I deserve to be loved. So it's no surprise I couldn't accept who I was. It's no surprise I tried to hide beneath the surface, try to convince the world and myself that I was perfect. I felt this person to be worthless. I was a thousand different people each more broken than stained glass in cathedrals, binging on shame in doses that were lethal. Until I was convinced that God's mercy must not exist. How could a loving God make you feel like this, like you don't deserve to live? Shame must be the devil's greatest trick because it placed a vast abyss between me and my God, convincing me I was a fraud, that I was my flaws. It took 10 years before I saw that I never felt like I belonged because my perception of God was wrong. I realized the real lie was to think I had to be perfect to come to faith when it's God who erases all our mistakes. I wish I could go back in the past and make that confused girl grasp the infinite mercy that God has. I wish someone would have been there to say what I will say today. God's love is not based solely on how we behave. He is entirely independent from what he creates. His love is unconditional. It doesn't just depend on our faith. Our actions and thoughts could never change the fact that God cares, that his love is infinite and God shares, that his mercy precedes his wrath, that love are the tiles that pave his path, that he doesn't judge or condemn our filth or our sins, only seeks for us to turn back to him. So don't be afraid to come with your shame. God already knows everything anyways. Not returning to God because you're too filthy is like not taking a shower because you're too dirty. It makes no sense. Because if we didn't make mistakes, God said he'd create another creation that did because he loves that much to forgive. So this life is not just about wrong versus right. It's about reaching toward the light. It's about knowing who you are that you are not defined just by your scars, that you were chosen over the mountains and the stars to be the carrier of God's names in your heart. So next time shame tries to poke holes in your boat of faith, next time you hear whispers that say you'll never be saved, look at the serpent straight in the eyes and tear off your human disguise and blind the darkness with your infinite light. Tell the devil that this time you won't be tricked by his lies, that this time you see that you are a mirror for the divine, so you were already perfect inside because perfection is not to be free from flaws or defects. It's to never forget the forgiving God that you reflect. Alhamdulillah. That was amazing. Absolutely amazing. I've had shivers just listening to this. Um, and I'm sure so have the uh, viewers. I love the analogies you make. I love how you talked about the cracked glass, the cigarette buds, and how you've made it sound where you've come from to where you are. And again, how sometimes we wait for that perfection to be there before we turn to God. But that's why he wants yeah. us to turn to him. Because if we were perfect, there's no need to, right? Right. That's, I mean, that's such a deep reflection that you just said, is that in a way, our imperfection, it makes space for us to turn to him as the perfect one. You know, our forgetfulness turns us to remembrance. And um, for us not to forget that, um, it's it's like you mentioned before too, which is something that Rumi has said. And it's like, it's that wound that allows the light. It, it's it's the lack that allows <laughs> for his presence, you know? and And I think sometimes we, we try everything to do to like, patch up the lack, you know? We, we make prayers in front of God that are too polite. I don't mean not to be polite with God. I don't mean not to have adab. I mean, don't be fake with him. Don't make prayers that are rehe like rehearsed if you're doing a dua, like you wanna be real. This is, he already knows everything. He's not surprised. And I think sometimes we still think it's like a human friend. We treat it like, oh, I, I don't want to say something that, that come with your whole self. And that's where the real healing, I think, begins. 
That's that's so beautiful. And the thing is, like, we can actually see that through your book. The du'a that I read to you earlier from a passage that was here, it doesn't look like something that was scripted and thought about and each word had to be in the right place to make it fit perfectly. It's just what came out of your heart is what's written. And when something comes out of the heart, it attaches to the heart of another human being. And I think that's what I realize about this book, that it doesn't look like you have staged it. It's not what word will fit in this sentence. It's what's my heart feeling at this point in order to say what I'm saying. Is that is that correct? Was it quite heart-based in what you've written? Yeah, that's, um, yeah, I think, you know, for me, um, even in writing the book, I actually had about 10 friends read through it. And the last editor, though, like, really the, the thing that she brought was anywhere where it felt feels like it's not heartfelt, I want you to point out so that I could sit with it. Because I didn't want what sometimes happens and some of the books, you know, I've read across traditions, different traditions as well, where you get to the point where you feel like the author wants you to know something about the author, meaning that they're educated or that they're smart or they've learned all these things. Like I didn't want myself to find its way into the book because I knew nobody would reach for this book because of me. And so the only thing you have is heart because if it's by mind, I'm not qualified, but if it's by heart, we all share this one soul. Like we were created from this one soul. And in that space, even if the words are simple, even if they're imperfect, even if they're in the wrong places, we can understand each other. And I think to me, that's the real gift. Rumi talks about this in a particular poem of his where you know, he, he's talking about two lovers. And usually that's always a reference to God, but he's talking about two lovers and he's saying, you know, when, you, when you're far from someone, you speak in the, in the voice that we're speaking. But if me and you were in the same room and I came close to you to whisper, closer to you, my voice gets lower and lower and lower, right? And if I get really close to your ear, like only you can hear what I'm saying. But then if we're merged into one human suddenly and we like we lose our bodies and we're just one human, there is no more sound. It's silence. And in that silence, all of language exists. SubhanAllah, that's so beautiful. I think you've taken this a step further to when we hear about dua, what dua is, and when Prophet Musa, you know, asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that where are you to the person who calls you? And he says, I'm closer to you than your jugular vein. He says, I sit by the person who calls upon me, I'm here, talk to me and I will mm -hmm. answer you. And when you get so close, it becomes that najwa, that munajat of two people. But you've gone one step further to say when that merges, that's where all the languages come. And that's, that's you know, that, I think that's profound to even think that far. Um, but I think this makes us understand uh, the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you've mentioned this in your book. And I want to ask you, um, what is your definition of love? There is a part in here that says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is love. What is this love that you're talking about? You know, what we type into Google, it's a very lust, love, uh, you know, combination of the two things. But what is this true essence of love that you have put into the book? That's a great question. Um, you know, for me, uh, <laughs> it sounds morbid, but it's really not. When I hear love, I think death. And what I mean by that is I think death of separation death of multiplicity what does it mean if i no longer have a body and you no longer have a body like what does that feel like i mean if i'm sitting next to you and i don't have a body and before you could say hey this is where hell's shoulder ends and this is where rehana's shoulders begins but if we don't have a body and it's just a breath you no longer can distinguish separation really things intermingle and in that unity, the one speaking and the one listening, there is no distinction. So that's where words lose meaning. Also where Rumi in his language of Farsi says, Khamush, he says silence. Because, and so for me, love is the unity and the unity is the underlying of everything. You might call it, you know, the collective unconscious. We might call it the one soul, depending on what tradition you come from. You may have a different word for it. But the reality is it's love is unity and the access point is death.
I don't mean death of the body. Of course, that comes for all of us. I mean death of the attachment to the ego, which distorts unity into multiplicity, kind of like when white light hits a prism and separates out into many colors. The, the color red doesn't belong to red. It belongs to the light. And blue doesn't belong to blue. It belongs to the light. The death returns to the light. And so for me, love is the removal of separation. It's the removal of distance. And when there is no space and there is no time, there's singularity. And so, you know, in quantum physics, you may call that the black hole and, you know, infinite, this sense of infinite gravity towards a singular point that seemingly doesn't exist and it doesn't make sense to scientists, but Yet that's sort of like what we're talking about. And so for me, love is a death of separation um, and is a death of limitation. And um, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, a good that's, question. A, that's an amazing way to think about it, that, that love is, when you said death, I was wondering how is death related to love? But that's so true of how it's the death of yourself as a being. Uh, to be able to unite and, you know, being lower or being higher than someone is completely different to being one with someone. And again, having those qualities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala within you allows that love, that connection with our true, true divine um, light that we should be having rather than, you know, with all the other loves that we class in the dunya. So that's so powerful. And linking to that, so love is one part of this book that you talk about quite a bit. There's another part in there where you're talking a lot about the ego. Um, I think this is a massive thing that plays up in so many relationships, you know, be it friends, be it spouses, being families. Um, everyone has an ego that obviously, you know, it's a human trait that sometimes, you know, my ego has been hurt or um, my ego has been affected. How do you describe this ego um, within this book that you have um, explained so beautifully? Yeah, that's a, you know, it's a great question. Um, you know, I think things like, for example, personality or preferences. Today, we have a lot, we make a lot of emphasis on preferences, like, oh, this is just my preference. This is just how I feel. This is what I'm attracted to. This is what I'm not attracted to. And we see that as truth. But really, like, one description of personality is, you know, a bundle of reactions and responses accumulated through your past that you have taken and identified with who you are. But had you have a different past and a different society and a different culture, your personality could be very different. And so the ego to me is, it creates the space in a way for you to witness the divine. But then at the same time, it's kind of like this, you, you move away from the, new, like I describe it as like, you can't read a book with your face with your nose touching its page, create a little bit of space to be able to read. But at the same time, that allows your sense perceptions to witness something of unity through multiplicity. And the ego gives you a moment of that when it's purified. But there's this ego, this, this lower self that can totally push you away from divinity. And then there is this purified, contented self that makes, becomes a vehicle for you to witness unity. And so there is this entity inside of you that allows for you to have an experience. Because if you're in the unity, like I said, if the one speaking is the one hearing, you have no experience. There is no witnessing. There is no experience. And so I feel like there's this level of separation that allows for you to witness. And it allows for you to go to the, it's like, I always say this is Adam and Eve were in heaven ev with everything they could possibly have. But there is this desire in the Quran, it says, you know, they eat, in the Bible, it says the tree of knowledge. In the Quran, it says like, they essentially want to worship God eternally, like angels, like the, the shaitan gets them to eat this fruit by saying, hey, you want, don't you want to be like the angels and live forever? And they're like, yeah, and worship God. So they eat this fruit. So what happens is they want eternal life. So what does Allah give them? Death. Allah gives them mortal life because the only way to 
actualize eternal life and to have value for eternity is that if you taste death, otherwise it has no value. For, for us, health has no value until you're sick and you're like, oh man, health is very valuable. But until that moment, you don't have value for it. You don't, you can't really attribute value because we understand existence through opposites. And so the ego comes in and it creates enough friction, enough duality for you to witness something. And then it's your experience of refining that. And so it's almost this like very interesting, I always, I mean, I know there's like a textbook way of talking about it and I'm talking about it in a less of a textbook way because I think you could look that up online. You could look at about the nafs and all of the roots and all that thing and that's fine. But my experience is it's a gift from God because he made us this way. It was intentional. It wasn't accidental. God doesn't make mistakes. So how do we walk through the voices of the nafs of the ego and turn them one by one to God. And I'm gonna say one thing, cause I, cause I, it was very helpful for me. When you hear the voice, never and always, those are voices of the nafs and the shaitan. You turn that back. When you hear, I will always be like this. I will never be able to pray all my prayers. I will never be able to wake up for Fajr. I will always make this sin. I will always, these thoughts, these absolute thoughts, that's when you're in the lower self. And so that opportunity when you're in the lower self is to turn it back to Allah. And it, in my experience, when I'm in the lowest states of the nafs, it's the greatest openings to turn to God because I am at the bottom of the barrel. Like Imam Ali says it in an interesting way. He's like, when the world pushes you to your knees, it's the perfect position to pray. He's reframing trials and struggles. Instead of saying, oh, poor you, he's saying, well, you're so lucky because now you have nowhere else to look. You've exhausted every other opportunity. So you have to look at God. What a gift. Um, yeah, that, that's so beautiful. To understand the ego like that, I think, is such a, such a powerful understanding and, uh, you know, what we see and preference and how it's how it can relate to the human mind and the human soul. I think that's so powerful. So your, your analogies, I think, really hit the heart because it's not textbook material. And I think you mentioned this in um, one of your other talk shows that um, there's so many um, Islamic books out there. Uh, what made you write a book that was very simple uh, to understand? Um, as opposed to these, you know, the heavy textbooks that people may turn to if they want to turn back uh, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Um, yeah, it's a really good question. I think for me, I love heavy, you know, one of my favorite translators is William Chittick. He translates, you know, very, it's like very heavy. Every page takes you days to really understand and get through. And I love that. But I also recognize it can be very boring and very dry. And with a generation of not having, we have like less and less attention spans. And in reading those books, I realized that they're so beautiful, but what would make my heart open? And I realized with my teachers, when they would teach me, my heart, man, my heart would open. And I went all over the world listening to teachers and like the most popular people talking and no one quite did it you know, sitting on a living room floor of someone's house, crammed in a room, listening to someone who doesn't want to be on the internet, who doesn't, and not that there's anything bad about that, but it's like all they want to do is transmit love from their heart to your heart. And the message is very specific for the group in the room. That's how Islam was taught for hundreds of years. And I thought, well, there's no way to have the most information because I'm not a scholar who studied for 50 years, but what would open a heart? And in the books that I read, I would always ask myself, what opened my heart? What sentence inspired me? What quote made me feel closer to God? Because this religion isn't about understanding the most. Although the first word is Iqra, right? But our prophet, peace be upon him, couldn't read. Right, so there's this le there's this element of sometimes we fight in the scholarly world 
oh, I know more and you learn and you learn and you learn and I'm guilty, I love reading. But really, this path is about practice. It's about what you let inside. Rumi has a story and I love this. You know, he, he basically says, you know, in the time of the prophet, peace be upon him, his, his companions, you know, they, they didn't, they hadn't memorized the entire Quran like people in Rumi's era. Everyone had memorized it. And he's like, you know, some of the companions, it, it took them 17 years to learn Baghdad, you know? And he's like, well, what's the difference between them and us? Are we better than them? Are we better than the companions in the Ahlul Bayt? Because we've, you know, memorized the entire book. And he said, no. He said, because hmm, while we eat, it's like going to a feast and eating food and then spitting it out and getting another meal, spitting it out. And, get, and so you, you put the entire feast in your mouth, but you never swallow. So you're able to consume all of it, but you never swallow. The difference was they ate, they swallowed, they digested, they lived, they became the message. So this path isn't about just putting more information in your mouth. It's about, can you digest, like, what can you take in that you can digest? And I remember with my teachers, we would ask questions and they would say, why do you want to know the answer to that? And you're like, because I'm just, in and they're like, how would that help your walking? And you realize 90% of questions are just for your ego to know. It's just to feel like you're knowledgeable. And then they didn't, obviously they wanted us to learn, but their emphasis was what will make you become a better Muslim, not just know more about Islam. So I, I feel like when I was writing this book, I was trying to collect information. That's why I say I feel like a flower picker and making little bouquets because it's not my, I didn't come up with these ideas, but what can I take that like opens the heart inshallah because I want to become a better Muslim. I don't want to just know a bunch of information. And so in writing this book, I didn't even have an outline. Like the chapters would just be like, this is the next thing. And I guess this one's the next one. And it kind of found its own form. You know, I wrote a chapter on heaven and hell before I ever writ wrote the Shahada. It was like all over the place because it was just what, would, what was opening my heart. And um, so I, I, I'm, I'm grateful to Allah for the guidance. It's, honestly, it's this, it's this um, humbleness and this humility that has led you to uh, definitely get so far and inspire so many others, as I've said, because you've recognized that, you know what, this is not me, this is not you, this is not us, this is all, you know, from him, it's a gift from him. That, alhamdulillah, you decided to take the first step and so many people have been inspired through it. So I'm just going to take a few more questions and a few more feedback comments because um, we are getting to the end of our interview. I wish this could just carry on because all these questions are unplanned, yet I'm learning so much and I'm absolutely loving it. So I actually wish you could carry on. You're such an amazing person to speak to, alhamdulillah, so inspiring. Um, so inshallah, I hope we get to do this again at some point. Inshallah. Um, so someone has asked, I'm not sure, um, I know we said no um, actual thick questions, but just because someone's asked it, I will ask it to you. Um, why has God created us? It seems that when we look at the prophet and, it's glo and we glorify and worship God, so did he. An example is when Prophet Ibrahim was finally gifted a son only to be asked to sacrifice him. What was the point of that? Hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a beautiful question. And, um, you know, it, I think a lot of us struggle with with that particular story. So how, how can God ask you to sacrifice your son? And how could she ask you to kill some an innocent child? And then I think the story in it is the beauty of it is that Allah wants to, you know, remember the Prophet Ibrahim, peace be upon him, was the one who broke the idols in the Kaaba. And the, the Kaaba of the believer is the heart in a way too, that in internal Kaaba, there's an internal Kaaba and there's that external Kaaba. And so 
it's this confrontation. It's like, okay, you broke the outer idols, but can you break the, even the potentiality of an idol of your son? Not that he took his son before Allah, but even the, the potential, the possible domino um, in the future to fall, sever that. So what is being asked to kill is the attachment to the human being. And look, he's waited for decades. So this shows us not just uh, many things. On the one hand, it shows, look at the humility and the surrender of his son. And because Ishmael, is this something Allah wants? I'm okay with it. There is no need to understand. You know, that gives me shivers in my, there is no need for me to understand. If it's God's wisdom, that's enough for me. Because I am on this earth because of God's wisdom. Makes no sense why I'm here. Like, I would never know the why. Science, by the way, never can ask, answer the question why. It can only postulate on how and what, but never why. Because why has it has a qualitative um, element that's not quantitative. So without Allah telling us why, we have no idea. We have no idea. And so one of the gifts is to see the surrender of his son. I don't need to understand, right? As opposed to Noah's son, when the flood comes, he says, what? I'm going to go on the top of the mountain. I will be fine. And Noah says, no one will be saved from this flood, meaning your mind cannot save you from what Allah plans. He went to the summit of a mountain. That's like the summit of the intellect. It will not surpass what Allah's wisdom is. So here are two sons of two prophets, and it's interesting to look at the two. And then on the other hand, for the prophet Ibrahim, for those of us that are parents, it also shows us to not co-opt the dreams of our children. We need to not let our unmanifested dreams control and steer our children's lives. And that's another gift. Sever that attachment and ownership over your child's becoming. That's in Allah's hands. We're called to teach our faith to our children. We're called to guide them, but it's not on us to force them into things that we didn't get to do or, or whatever. And so this story is such a gift because if we look deeply in it, we see such teachings. And so for me, one of the practices, I think it's in the book, but I think it's in the, um, in the uh, Hajj section, but it's about like writing idols that you have, you know, um, attachments that you have. Because we don't, most people don't worship stones and wood. We worship people's opinions of us and um, money and security and our salary or whatever. So one of the practices is to write these things and put them around you and look at them and look at how they influence your life. Because every idol in our way prevents us from witnessing a law. Because what happens is, and I don't want to make this too long, I'm sure as quick as possible, but what happens is everything that we reach for, we're ultimately reaching for God. So when an addict reaches for alcohol, that addict is reaching for a law. They just landed on the bottle. In other words, meaning if you go to an AA meeting, Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous meeting, and you listen deeply in those circles, you will never hear someone say, I, I became an addict because I wanted to drink, period. It's always, I became an addict because I was looking for home, because I was looking for peace, because I was looking for love, because I was looking for family, because I was looking for safety. And these are al-mu'min, al-wadud. You know, they're, they're looking for qualities of Allah, but we just landed. What is that hidden idol called alcohol? Hidden, I'm looking for security. I land on my salary. But I'm actually looking for a law. I just got intercepted. So when you see that, then everyone you see, deeply, their heart, Allah says, I created you to worship. You either are going to worship me or you're going to worship, you're going to land on an idol. There is no other way. 
we were created servants and slaves, which means we will look for a master. The master, if it's the world, we remain a slave. If it's a law, we become a king. And that's the most <laughs> remarkable, almost hilarious, but most beautiful thing is that no matter where, even when you're with your idol, if you keep, if you ask yourself, what is drawing me to this? You will find that it's a longing for God. You just got intercepted. So then at that moment, your station is the station of Ibrahim. Can you sacrifice? It's not your son and it's not literal, but can you sacrifice your attachment to your money? It doesn't mean money is bad. It's the attachment. It's the thinking that it can save you or it can protect you. That's what you sever. I hope that makes sense. It really makes sense. And I think a lot of the viewers have been writing that it's so beautifully explained that they've never thought about it. Like that even when you said when an alcoholic uh, searches for that bottle, they're actually trying to get to God. It didn't make sense. But when you've explained that, it's so, so true. They are yearning for those qualities that they want to achieve but you know the easiest way is maybe getting a bottle out of it and it's it's so um well explained that it makes so much sense so it's not even about not having these things but it's about not being attached to these things and it's amazing that when you break that attachment or when you get rid of that attachment that thing comes back to you in manifolds and mm -hmm. you think i finally broken the attachment but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us all i wanted to do was break the attachment now you can have it because now you're not addicted to it anymore it's amazing you literally look at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, I know what you're doing. Like, I get it. I get it. But it's just, it's hard when you're in that situation. So um, we are finishing and we were supposed to finish a few minutes ago, but a few questions have just come in. Um, a lot of people have asked, are we able to get hold of that poem that you read out to us? Um, yeah, sure. I can send it to you. Would you like me to send it to you guys? And then Please, or... if you can. And then inshallah, I think they can maybe share it out with the viewers on Lantern of Light or um, okay. you know, that might yeah. be a good one. Thank you. Um, a few other people have said um, this has been so eye-opening, um, a great way for us to be able to understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, but one question they have asked is, how do you work towards being rather than seeming to be? How do you get back on that path of love? How do you return um, back on your journey of love? How does somebody begin? Where do they start this journey of falling in love with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Hmm, it's a beautiful question. It, it reminds me of the prayer. And I talk about this in a Salat session, but you know, prayer begins where you're standing. And when you bow down and you look at your feet, between your feet, when your hands are on your knees and you look between your feet, that's where you start, right there, where you are here and now. Prayer is a very, it has a physical element because it reminds you that you are, you are in body and you're in this time and you're in this space. So you begin now and you begin exactly with how you're feeling. You don't try to be someone else. You don't try to have the faith of someone else or pretend that there's something else. You start exactly where you are. Because the reality is, Allah says, I created, you were created on fitra, right? And you were created good. But you're created innately good. So there's no finding out over there in the world. It's right here. Everything, Allah says, I'm closer to you than jugular vein. Closer to you than your jugular vein. So everything in this room, wherever you're sitting, Allah is present with you. You do not need to go anywhere rather than where you are. Right here. He's with you. When you go to Mecca, he's with you. When you go to Medina, he's with you. When you're on a beach sitting there looking at the ocean, he's with you. In this mysterious way, he's with you. So you start exactly where you are and you start with exactly how you feel. So if you feel frustrated, if you feel confused, if you feel doubt, you take that to God. You don't deal with the doubt and the frustration and the pain on your own and show up to God perfect. The problem is mosques have become a museum for good people when it's actually a hospital for broken people in pain. It's not a museum for good people pretending. We're supposed to come to God with all of exactly how we're feeling. And so if you want to know 
how to walk on this path, it's the, the most incredible thing is you don't have to know anything at all. You just have to be present with where you're at and walk from there. You don't want to be like me. Lord, I'll tell you, you don't want to be like me because I know all my faults. You start exactly where you are and you ask Allah for help because Allah meets each person exactly where they are and uniquely. That's why Allah says, don't compare yourself to others. You know, when he meets you with the greatest possible potential of you getting to know him and it's customized for you. That's why when you are faced in the other life and the day of judgment, Allah never asks you about what other people did. He never gonna ask you. He never gonna ask you why they did that. He's just gonna say, what did you do? How'd you respond? So you begin exactly where you are and you ask him for help. And don't hide your faults from the one who sees faults. Don't hide your sins from the one who forgives sins. Don't hide your, hide your pain from the healer. It's like going to the doctor and pretending you don't have pain. Don't do that. Show up exactly how you are and I promise you your life will begin to change. Because our lack takes space for his everything. And the more you acknowledge your neediness, the more receptive you become. So your life completely changes. And it's not because of us. It's just because we're aware of all that he is in every moment. It's like there's this verse in the Quran that says, if you're grateful, I will give you more. But God's not dependent on you, which means if you're grateful, you end up receiving all that he's already giving but you're not aware of in your ingratitude. The, the devil, Shaitan Iblis, was in heaven. He was in heaven and he was jealous. He had everything, but if your eyes are closed, heaven doesn't look like much of anything. If I blindfold you, it doesn't matter how beautiful the view in front of you is. All you see is the blindfold. So you start with your blindfold. You don't try to go somewhere to find God. You just say, if I remove the blindfold, I will be in the presence of God because he never leaves. If I perceive distance, Ibn Atala says that if we perceive distance, it's because of our reality, not his. And to me, that's like this incredible, like it makes me so happy gift because you can't run away from God. Because you, if you run away from God, you only run into God. Not that he has a physical being you see the language is limited, but you can't run away from the one who created space. And there's no time in which he's not holding. And that's the real gift. No matter what you do or who you are, he's with you. He's with these love, these people I love in prison. He's with them as much as he's with us. And that's just this incredible blessing that I run out of words to express. SubhanAllah, it's such a beautiful way to think about it, that when you try to run away from God, you will run into him. And that's so true. And it's when you're at that lowest um, uh, part of yourself or that lowest version of yourself that you're just down in the dumps, that's when you find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I think it's so important that um, you know we realize that we have to go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with our imperfections, not being perfect, allowing ourselves to go to this hospital, as you put it, within the mosque, allowing to be healed, allowing that healing. Because when you don't allow it in, um, there's only so much that you know can actually come into us. And I think there was a quote from Rumi that you had somewhere in the book saying, uh, there can be so much light around the world, but it just depends how big your window is. Yeah. So how much are you allowing um, to come into this? So um, we've come towards the end of um, our interview and I think we could have gone on for ages because I've literally touched maybe the first paragraph or the first um, chapter of this book. I still think I had loads to ask you i wanted to know about the journal which i have um, ordered and it should have it by tomorrow so i'm really excited to um start using that inshallah um but just as we wrap up now um you've given us a lot of food for thought you've given us so many ways in order to open our hearts and understand that the door of the divine is always kept open for us he's just waiting for us to turn to him. Um, are there any final words that you'd like to tell us, um, that you'd like to leave with our viewers? 
Um, I know in the book you put in a lot of uh, quotes. There's a lot of um, hadith from our Holy Prophet. There is lots of Quranic ayats. And I'm sure this was in order to get the reader to now connect with the Holy Book. Um, but are there any final words that you'd like to leave the viewers with? Hmm. I just wanted to say, Alhamdulillah, and thank you so much to you, Sister Rehana. And I think everyone is very aware of the special presence that you bring. And I can see the light in your face and the sincerity. And I pray deeply that Allah blesses you and that any burdens on your heart, those that are seen and unseen, that Allah lifts that burden from you and allows you to walk on this path with, with a steady heart and an open soul. And I pray that you are able to see how special you are and your ability to hold space for so many people with such excellence and such a son. I know, like, I know that the viewers and the listeners could feel that. And whenever something comes from one heart to the other, it's the space that's created that allows for that. And so I thank you deeply for that. And um, I pray for you and your family deeply. And I'm grateful for everybody who is able to come on this call and I pray that Allah forgives me for my mistakes and that all that is good, as you know, is from Allah. And and that's the truth. And I'll, I'll end with like a little brief story just to share just the power of Allah's name is, you know, at work we were in a meeting. I was in a meeting and, and um, <clears throat> sometimes when things get tense, I, um, under my breath, I'll, I'll say Allah, but it will sound like this because it's like hidden. So I, I would do this every once in a while when something would get tense in this environment, I, I just do a breath of a law. And a couple weeks passed and my coworker who's not Muslim, she came to me and she said, you know, I've noticed when certain things happen, you do this <laughs> sound. Um, and I started copying you in my life. And when things are tense, I go, <sighs> and it makes everything better. What are you saying? <laughs> I was like, oh, um, I'm saying a law. And she's like, what does that mean? <laughs> and I was like, God. And just to realize that without understanding, without knowledge, without degrees, without reading books, the name of Allah gave her peace. That's just the power of the name before a relationship is even established. And so I offer this the practice of when you breathe in, you say, Al, la. And when you breathe out, you say, La. And in your breaths, you hold a law in your breath. And whenever something is difficult or tricky, or, or or hard for you, you breathe the name of God and know that the name on its own has power beyond any understanding or words or books. And the end of the day, books are just ink on paper. What makes it come to life is whatever life Allah puts in it. So don't look at this book as something special. Look at the God who makes special things happen from ordinary things. Look at the God who makes a staff into a snake, who makes a staff part seas, who makes ordinary men establish miracles, who makes the voice of Jesus give eyes to the blind, give life to the dead. God uses ordinary things every single day to do miraculous things. And so we don't have to be extraordinary to create unbelievable things in this life, we just have to turn to Allah and step into our water, our Red Sea, whatever that may be, and trust that Allah will make a way. So I pray for every single one of you, I pray that Allah makes a way in whatever you're facing. I pray that you, you remember that Allah sees you and he understands deeply what you're feeling. Even if sometimes you feel like you're alone, he is with you. And with every breath he is with you, he is closer to you than the life 
inside of you. Whatever that means, it's mysterious, but he's closer to you than that. And as Ibn Atala says, Allah is not veiled due to his distance. He's veiled due to his proximity. <laughs> Subhanallah. And um, and I just want to end with that, inshallah. Alhamdulillah. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure to have you with us. And uh, Jazakallah khair for your beautiful du'as. I can't take the credit for this. This was all done uh, via Lantern of Light. I'm just a glorified microphone that you see on the screen. This was nothing to do with me. It was the whole of the Lantern of Light team that Alhamdulillah put this program together, yet it gave me the opportunity uh, to be able to have this blessing of actually having spoken to you, um, unpack the book of the secrets of divine love. And it was a book very, very close to my heart. So when this uh, came up that this interview will be happening, I straight said, I'll do it. Um, so yeah. alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. But thank you so much uh, for your kind words. Inshallah, we take this forward with us that we breathe the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And um, with the beautiful story that you said, it reminded me of the time that there was a man and he was praying to his God, not our Lord, but his God. And he kept saying, Ya Sanam, Ya Sanam, Ya Sanam. And accidentally, as his eye was about to close, he accidentally said, Ya Samad, which was the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, La Baik. And if I'm not mistaken, it was Prophet Musa who says, he wasn't even calling you. He was calling his deity. It wasn't you. And he said, even if you called me by mistake, I am there to answer. I'm there to say, La Baik. And um, this gives us hope that we don't have to be perfect. We don't have to be these pristine Zen framed individuals who only when we're ready, we turn to God. It's time to turn to him when we're not ready so that inshallah, we're able to build on that path and actually get closer on that ladder of divinity, closer to our true potential of why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put us on this earth for. So thank you so, so much, um, Sister Halwa, for being with us, for sharing with us your knowledge, your kind words, your heartfelt, soulful reasoning behind this book and it gives us all hope that whenever we are in trouble when we are in trials all we need to do is turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as it's not the end of our road it's just a bend in our road something that tests us but what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala trying to teach us through that so thank you to all of our viewers who joined in today we really hope you enjoyed the program I know I did there is so much I've taken back um, especially at this end with breathing the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Please do follow us on our new website of www.lanternoflight.co.uk. You can follow us on the Lantern of Light official Instagram page, where again, there will be nuggets of advice, nuggets of so many different um, aspects that we can take into our life and become inspired to be those true individuals that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put us on this earth for. So Jazakallah khair for joining us. Thank you for all of your comments, your feedback, your questions. Inshallah, the poem will be shared and you'll be able to find it on the Instagram page, which Lantern of Light will then share out. Again, Jazakallah khair for being here. Please do stay safe and Inshallah, we'll meet you on our next program. Assalamu alaikum. My Lord, have mercy upon the weakness of my body, the thinness of my skin, and the frailty of my bones. Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi. You are the one who forgives Time after time I stray away 
from the path that you have paved. Time after time you come back and say, O oh believer, in you I have faith. I turn to you, I ask of you, Ya Sayyidina, guide me through. Ya Rabbi, 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 Ya Mujib, Ya Mujib, Ya Mujib, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, You are the one who responds. When I am broken and full of pain, I wonder where do I complain? But you're closer to me than my vein And remind me to call out your name Udu'uni astajib lakum Udu'uni astajib lakum Udu'uni astajib lakum Call on me, I will answer you I turn to you I ask of you, Ya Sari, Ya guide me through. Ya Latif, Ya Latif, Ya Latif, Ya Latif, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, You are the one who is gentle. I can't remember how many ways I've called you with pain and dismay, but I can't remember till this day a reply with no loving embrace. I turn to you, I ask of you, Ya Sari, Ya Riva, guide me through. Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, You are the one who loves. Ya Wadud, Ya Wadud, Ya Wadud, Ya Wadud, Ya Wadud. I know I'm sinful and turn away. From your kindness you show every day Yet you still guide me back on your way As your love saves me going astray I turn to you, I ask of you Ya Sari, Ya Riva, guide me through Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi Ya Allah, Ya Allah, You are the only light. Darkness has clouded my heart. How do I try? Where do I start? Your love for me ignites a spark. Let your light in me never depart. I turn to you. Ya Sari, Ya Rida, guide me through Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi Ya Razaq, Ya Razaq Ya Razaq, Ya Razaq, Ya Razaq Ya Allah, Ya Allah you are the one who 
provide. Without your risk, we have nothing. The Quran's words are so telling. We only give from your provision. Through you is our status risen. I turn to you, I ask of you. Ya Sadi Al-Rida, guide me through. Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi. Ya Hadi, Ya Hadi, Ya Hadi, Ya Hadi. Placing you now, it's hard to tell false from true, but with your guidance as our cue, I know now I can start anew. I turn to you, I ask of you, Ya Sadi Al Rida, guide me through.